All of us have heroes that we look at in the Bible that we admire. And sometimes they're just heroes or, or heroines that we look at and we, we, we attach to them somehow, that they have a personality or a way about them that, that we relate to. You know, men who God used to slay giants or women who seem to, beyond odds, uh, continue to be faithful to God in very difficult situations. People uh, God used to, to talk to kings, to preach great sermons, uh, to rule kingdoms. And we look at these people and we can see these heroes. Well, there is an unsung hero in the Bible. Now, there's many unsung heroes, but what's special about this one is the realization of the amount of impact he had on the early church. His impact on the early church was enormous, more than people realize. And he's mentioned, and if you don't put the story together, you don't realize how much he was involved in the formation of the early church. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. Anybody know who I'm going to talk about? Okay. He's not somebody most of us think about. Acts chapter 4, verse 33. Here we are in the early church. There's lots of exciting things going on. And it says in verse 33, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor were there, was there anyone among them who lacked... For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distribute to each as anyone had need. So here we have a church that had grown, by the way, very quickly. And there were lots of people there and they had needs. It appears that in, uh, after the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, many people had come from all over, you know, Jews from all over the empire, Roman Empire had come there to keep Pentecost. It appears that many of them stayed. And so they had a real financial crisis in the early church and how are we going to take care of all these people? So people were selling some of their land, maybe excess land they had. Some people were selling houses or whatever. And people are selling things the people who live there in Judea, and they're giving their, their proceeds, what they have, to the, to the church to help take care of this, this mass of people. The church is growing at a remarkable rate. I mean, 3,000 baptisms in one day. Remember, those 3,000 were just in this, that's in Jerusalem. The church at this point is in Jerusalem. They haven't really spread out beyond there much. And so here you have this, this church that's growing and having great impact. In verse 36, and Joseph who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, okay, we'd say, well, that's an interesting thing. This man named Barnabas comes in and, and he sells some land and he gives it. But what's important here is to notice the impact this man is having. Now, lots of people were selling things and giving the money to the apostles to take care of the people. Because it says they were. But this one is singled out. And he's singled out to the point where it says the apostles had given him a nickname. They called him the son of encouragement. This man simply encouraged people wherever he went. It was part of who he was. It was part of his character. Encouragement's an uh, interesting word in English. You know, we talk about discouragement. I gave a sermon here a few months ago on, go on being discouraged. That means to be without courage. To be discouraged means I'm without courage. I, 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 don't, I don't know how to go on. I, I'm giving up. I'm discouraged. Encouraged is the opposite. To encourage someone is to give them courage, to give them hope, to give them purpose so that they move forward. To encourage people is to move them forward, that they have more courage and more hope. This man, through his very presence, gave people such hope, such courage, that they nicknamed him the son who gives courage. That's the nickname that the apostles gave him. 
Now, all of us could tell times in our lives when we need encouragement. We need someone to come along and help us along, to, to convince us, to help us that we need to move forward, that the things can get better, that God's still in our lives, that no matter what we're going through, the tests and the trials that we may be suffering, there's purpose in it, to be encouraged. So we get up and we keep going. All of us need that. And all of us, and this is the purpose of the sermon today, is all of us can learn to give it. We all know what it's like to need encouragement. So I'm not going to talk about today your need to be encouraged because all of us need to be encouraged from time to time. But it's the ability to give encouragement. This man had this ability so great that in the scripture, in the Bible, it is mentioned he is the son of encouragement. That's what, that, that's what they called him. He brought encouragement into people's lives. So we're going to talk about how you and I can become better encouragers. Think, well, this isn't an important subject. No, actually it is. And we'll look through it and we'll see why. And one of the reasons why is, is God, it's one of the traits of God to encourage. It's one of God's traits to encourage. How many times have we read John 14? Let's go to John 14. And we really don't take to heart what is being said here. John chapter 14. This is part of what Jesus told his disciples on the night before he died. And that's why John 14 through 17 or 13 through 17 contains so much important information. He knows he's going to go and he's going to die and they're going to face the, the darkest times of their lives. And he's telling them everything they need to know that's important. And he's trying to encourage them. And then he tells them something that was, that's prophesied in the Old Testament, but something that they would not have fully understood. And he tells them here in John 14 verse 16, and I will pray the Father. Okay, so he says, I'm going to Ask this of the Father. When I do, he's going to do it. This is part of the plan. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. We know that the Holy Spirit is the very mind of God. The very mind of God. And here it's called the helper. It's a very interesting word in Greek. Because you'll see it translated as comforter or helper or sometimes it's uh, um, counselor. Well, in Greek, the word can mean all those things. This helper, it is a word of someone who helps, who encourages, who counsels, who comforts. And he says, I will send you this because I will pray to the Father and he will send it. Of course, we know that the Father and the Son both have the same spirit. And the, and the spirit will be sent. But notice what he's telling them. I'm going away, but I'm going to give you the comfort and the help and the encouragement you need. Verse 17, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Christ says to them, I will actually come to you through the spirit. You will receive the Holy Spirit that is with you and shall be in you. And this scripture we use quite a bit when we talk to people who are in the church and are moving towards baptism. You wouldn't be moving towards baptism unless God's Spirit was moving with, with you and taking you there. So God's Spirit is with us, but he said it will be in you. He would tell them later that the Father and I will abide in you. Abide means live. We will live in you, and you will live in us. And this is done through the Holy Spirit. God lives in us through the Holy Spirit. We live in him through the Holy Spirit. And here he describes this relationship. He says, as your helper, your comforter, I will come to you. I will not leave you an orphan. Too much of the time, our problem is, is we, we think we're orphans. We don't accept, really accept God as our father, and we're not accepting Christ as our brother. We accept God as God. We accept Christ as our sacrifice. 
When we don't accept the relationship of father and brother, when we don't accept the relationship of father and brother, we become orphans. We're orphans in this world. And Jesus here told his disciples, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will send you the power of God, the mind of God. When this happens, you will receive this comfort. You and I live in a world of discouragement. And it can drain us. Just, just being physical can drain us, right? We get tired. We get hungry. We get upset. We worry. Just being physical can drain us of encouragement. And here we see that God is an encourager, comforter, helper, counselor to us. And if God is an encourager by nature, then since we are to become the children of God, we are to become encouragers by nature. Now, it's not going to change the fact that you and I need encouragement from time to time because we're still physical. You know what's the nice thing about God? He doesn't need encouragement. You know the nice thing about Christ? He doesn't need encouragement. But what is helpful for us is to when we look at the life of Jesus, when the Word became flesh, in that time period he was flesh, he needed encouragement. <laughs> When he became like us, he needed encouragement. When he returned to what he was, he didn't need encouragement anymore. What in the world drains courage from God? See, nothing can drain away the father or the son's courage. But he knows what it's like to need encouragement because he became like us. He became flesh. So it is part of our Job, it's part of what God wants to do in us, is to help us become encouragers. So that as each of us suffers discouragement, there is someone else there to help us along. Now, we just read that God will do it. We have to rely on God to give us courage. We have to rely on God to, to help us stay positive. We have to rely on God to keep us focused. But he also sends us each other. And that's why it's important that each of us learn how to be an encourager so that we can encourage others when they need it, and we can be encouraged by others when we need it. It's very interesting, the Greek word, son of encouragement. Uh, Paraklesis is related to the word that is translated comforter or helper in John. They're related words. He is the son of helper, the son of comfort. The son of encouragement. Just like God's spirit, when God's spirit comes to us, it brings to us from God help and comfort and counseling. Now, there are two basic ways that we can help others when they need encouragement. 2 Corinthians 1. Let's look at the first way here. 2 Corinthians 1. Verse 3. Here Paul says to the church at Corinth, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. Remember the word comfort, and at least um, encouragement, comfort, and aren't the same word in Greek, but they're related words. Who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. With the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now that, okay, that sentence is a little convoluted in in English. But basically what he's saying is, because you and I can receive comfort from God, we are then to give that comfort to others. In other words, as we receive encouragement from God, we are required, we're supposed to pass it on. We're supposed to pass it on. That's why when we are constantly discouraged, constantly discouraged, we have to question ourselves, why are we not receiving enough encouragement from God? We have to go to God to receive it. As we receive encouragement, it gives us the ability to help others. And we'll talk about it in a minute, but you know one of the strange things about this? When you're really, really discouraged, you know what can help you more than anything else? 
encouraging someone else. There's something about giving that changes who we are. So here he says, we receive comfort in order to pass it on. So you have to receive it from God first. So let's read that verse again. Verse 4, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able, okay, he comforts us so that we are able to comfort those who are in any trouble, which the comfort, with the comfort by which we ourselves were comforted by God. For as the suffering of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now we are afflicted, for it is for your consolation and salvation. Now, Paul says, look, I'm going through a hard time right now. He says, but I'm going through it for you. He's talking to the church of Corinth. He says, yeah, my life is real hard right now. He said, but the reason my life is hard is because I'm doing this for you. And so he's finding purpose in it. He's finding encouragement in his trials because in this case, he's actually suffering for someone else. He says, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope is for you, is, I'm sorry, and our hope for you is steadfast. Because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will be taker of the consolation. In other words, he says, yes, we suffer. We suffer in this life. We become discouraged. We become discouraged because... We're physical. We become discouraged because we're Christians in a non-Christian world. And he says, but remember, when you suffer that, you will receive the encouragement. You receive it from God, and then you are expected to give that to others. So we just, this isn't just about, okay, I need encouragement. I need to go get encouragement. We talk about that quite a bit, receiving encouragement from God and help from God. No, that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about since God is an encourager, he expects us to become encouragers. He expects us to become encouragers, to help pull up others, to be outward in our viewpoint. Of course, the more inward we are, the less ability we have to encourage anybody else. I mean, when you're in the depth of discouragement, how do you encourage anybody else? You have to get encouragement first. So God gives us encouragement through his spirit. God will also give us encouragement through other human beings. When that happens, it gives us the ability to encourage. So we need to start looking for ways to be encouraged by God and then for us to encourage others. And here we do it when people are in trouble. The other way is something we've talked about every once in a while is to exhort people. Romans chapter 12 Romans chapter 12. Here's talking about gifts that are given to us in the church. Verse 6 says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. In prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, and he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. To exhort is different than to comfort. It actually has a different meaning. To comfort someone, and we're talking about the Greek words here, to comfort someone is someone who is in despair or discouragement or they're suffering in some way, and you bring them comfort, you bring them peace. And that's part of what this, this encouraging is. But there's another way to encourage people, and that's what exhortation is. Exhortation literally means to, pers to push someone to pursue an action. Exhortation can actually mean to correct somebody, that they're doing something wrong. But in exhortation, you're not trying to comfort them and bring them peace. You're pushing them to move. You're saying, you can't stay this way anymore. This won't work. You have to turn to God. You have to, and you're actually giving them encouragement through a little push. You're urging them to do something. So it's different than comfort. You know, if someone needs 
comforting. As someone is going through maybe the death of a loved one, the last thing they need you to do is to, you know, give them exhortation, right? Sometimes they need someone just to sit with them. That's all you can do. You need, that's comfort. Exhortation is another way that we encourage people because we motivate them to action. There's a time to go to somebody and say, you can't do this anymore. You, you're going to have to change. You're going to have to move forward. Something in your life has to change. How can I help you? And you push them. You give them an ur the urge to move forward. And the interesting thing about comfort, comfort has to do much with the here and now in the Greek, what you're going through right now. Exhortation has to do with the future. It has to do with a point in the future. It has to do with a goal. You're urging people to go someplace. We have this ability to help people who are discouraged, to remind them about the kingdom of God, what God is doing, about Christ's return, about the promises God makes, about the future that God has. God's preparing a future for all of us. And that future impacts us right now today. It's not just years from now. It's right now today God impacts our lives. And we can exhort each other in that way. So when we look at encouragers, they're both comforters and they're people who exhort others and they know when to do the one and when to do the other, which may, it takes a lot of wisdom. You know, if you comfort someone who needs ex ex to be exhorted, I've done this literally with little boys who are crying because they scraped, I remember one case, little boy scraped his knee. I don't know, he's 10 years old. He's surrounded by all these teenage girls. Oh, they're hugging him. They're, they're just giving him all this comfort. He didn't need comfort. He's crying. And I just walked in and said, hey. He stopped, he looked at me and I said, it's not much blood. Can you move your knee? Oh, yeah, 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 okay. Ah, you're tougher than that. You're okay. He stopped crying. Oh, okay. As soon as I walked away, all the girls going, oh, and he started crying again. <laughs> he liked the hugs, okay? He liked them, but, okay, he didn't need comfort. He needed exhortation. That's what he needed. Sometimes people need exhortation. Come on. Stand up. You're okay. I am? Oh, okay. And then sometimes we need comfort. And the wisdom is of the encourager is the encourager knows when to do that. Most of us sort of muddle through that part, right? I tend to exhort when I should comfort and comfort when I should exhort. It's hard to know when to do. Barnabas knew that. So let's look at a few traits of comforters, okay? of encouragers. People who can do both of these things, who encourage people that you and I know those people because we're around them, we're more stable when they leave. They've done something. They've given something to us. And then we have to learn to pass that on. We have to learn to encourage others. Acts 4. Let's go back to Acts 4. See something here about Barnabas again. We read this, verse 36. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by, the, Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. <coughs> having land, sold it, brought the money, laid it at the apostles' feet. He was a doer. Encouragers are doers. And one of the most difficult things to do when we're discouraged is to do. When we're discouraged, we stop, right? One of the signs of discouragement is you don't have the courage to do. You stop. And yet we can never really conquer discouragement until you do. You have to take a step. Encouragers are doers. In fact, encouragers... Uh, Encouragers are, are interesting people that really have this trait like Barnabas because they're just doing all the time. They're doing for others all the time. He sold, he did. 
He didn't expect anything in return. And that sort of brings us to the second point. They are doers, but whatever they do, it is, there are no strings attached to what they do. In other words, a, an encourager invites you over for dinner. They're not offended if you never invite them back. You ever do that, feel bad? Well, I invited them over and they never invited me back. Or I did this and that person never even thanked me. Encouragers aren't too concerned with that. You know why? They're looking for the next person to encourage. That's why. They're just looking for the next person to encourage. I encourage you. Good, my work's done here. Let's go encourage somebody else. Now, if you invite them over, that's great. They like it. But it doesn't bother them if you don't. Where we always tend to get, you know, it's sort of a, I did something nice for you. Why didn't you do something nice for me? Encouragers aren't like that. They also don't do anything for pretense. They simply do it for the person in front of them. Encouragers, encouragers encourage people don't even know they're doing it. That's what's so interesting about people who have this trait. They don't even know they're doing it. They simply do it. They encourage others because they, they look at others and say, oh, you need comfort. Or they look at others and they say, oh, you need some exhortation. They can be very, very gentle at times, and encouragers can be pretty tough at times. I've had some encouragers in my life that, you know, verbally slap me around pretty good. You got to get moving. You can't stay where you are. I've always thanked them afterwards. And then thank God I didn't punch them while they were doing it to me. We all need that. Encouragers do it because they see the need in the other person. So there's no fake to it. There's no, they're not, there's no pretense. They're not trying to be something else. And that's what's interesting about that story here in, in Acts 4 about Barnabas. You read Acts chapter 5 and the story of Ananias and Sapphira. They saw how everybody really looked up to Barnabas. But Barnabas wasn't doing it to be looked up to. Barnabas was doing it because it's, well, it's who he was. He just encouraged people. They wanted all the acclaim and the status he got, so they sold some land, kept some of it, of the money, lied to the apostles and said, here, we brought all this, now we want status too. And of course, what Peter said was, well, it was your land. You didn't have to sell it. You could have kept it. And you didn't have to give it all to us. You could have given a little bit to us. But you lied and told everybody you gave us all the money and you didn't. Why? The only reason you do that is you're trying to get some kind of status here. And what is amazing, I, I mean, this isn't the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. You know, the time where everybody thinks God isn't as harsh. God killed both of them for lying and trying to gain status on the, uh, you know, hems of, of, of Barnabas. He killed them both. There's no pretense to encouragers. They're just trying to encourage. Which leads us to another thing, a third thing about encouragers. Encouragers dwell on what God is doing in other people's lives He's not, they're not constantly wrapped up in their faults. Now, I'm not saying an encourager doesn't see somebody else's faults. I mean, that's the whole point about encouraging. Sometimes it's, it's telling somebody, it's that exhortation part, you can't stay where you are. I, I'm going to urge you, I'm going to push you, I'm going to help you, but you've got to move. You can't stay maybe in this sin or whatever. So it's not that encouragers are, you know, Pollyannish and pretend nobody has a fault or a sin, but it's not their focal point. Their focal point is what God is doing in somebody's life. What God is doing in somebody's, somebody's life. Let me give you an example. Acts 9. Acts chapter 9. Now I want you to think about if you would have lived at this time. And Saul is a man who works for the Sanhedrin, and his job is to hunt down Christians. And he had taken your uncle, and he had put him in jail. Uh, 
Some of the men that were with uh, Saul, you know, roughed up your grandmother, put her in prison, and then let her out because she was sick and she died. I mean, this man is persecuting people, throwing them in jail, and gave permission for them to stone Stephen. What if you knew Stephen? And what if now someone said, oh, he's converted and become a Christian? Probably the first thing that'd go through your mind, yeah, he's trying to infiltrate. He's going to pretend to be a Christian to get in here. Now he'll get all our names and we'll all go to jail. But of course, Saul, who became Paul, did convert. But the church did not want him. His sins were pretty terrible. Who could trust him? I mean, I understand why they didn't trust him. Verse 26 here, uh, checks, uh, Acts chapter 9. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. Yeah, this is just, this is just a ploy to get in here. That's all this is. Then we're all going to end up dead. But notice verse 27. Who is this? But Barnabas, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, had been spo- who, and he had spoken to him, and how he preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. We wouldn't have the apostle Paul, except Barnabas looked at him and said, God's working with you. God's forgiven you. I don't like you much. He said, I mean, he wouldn't have liked what he did either. But well, you're my brother. And we're going to go talk to Peter and John and James and tell them. And he took Paul to the leaders and said, this man is a man of God. A lot of courage in that. But what you see is this encourager. Encouragers, the son of encouragement. And what's amazing is Barnabas had such status that the apostles accepted Paul. He had such status among them. They trusted him so much. They accepted Paul. And from that point on, Paul was a major player in the early church. And it's because Barnabas took him there and said, no, we can't look at him for what he's done. We got to look at him for what God is doing in him. That's how encouragers are. That's how they think. Let's look at what God's doing in this person. And what's interesting is, Guess who trained Paul? Barnabas. You look through the book of Acts for many, many chapters, it's Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul, Paul's with him, and Barnabas is always the guy in charge. That changes after a time. But Barnabas trains Paul. He's the one that says, okay, this guy needs some exhortation. See, Barnabas' impact on the early church is much greater than we ever realize. See, wow, here's the trainer of Paul. You probably never thought about who trained Paul. Well, we know Jesus did. I mean, Jesus spent, he spent three years in the desert with Jesus. But he also had another physical person who took him around. Took him around pastoring with him. And it was Barnabas. Until Barnabas and Paul had a little bit of a problem. Acts 15. And this is just so in character with with Barnabas. Verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas. Now what we've watched here is, is Barnabas is an older man than Paul. But you see Paul beginning to become the leader here, which Barnabas all along seemed to know that's what he was training him to be. This guy is going to be used by God in a dramatic way. I mean, he went before all the apostles and told them that. Okay, and their response was, okay, he's yours. <laughs> okay, if, if you want him, you can have him. I mean, John didn't say, I'll take him, or James, or Peter. It's, okay, you can have him. Barnabas takes him and he trains him, and now Paul, has been, he's now the leader, and he's taking him, and Barnabas is quite comfortable with that arrangement. He says, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Now, they had planted 
churches all over what is now Asia Minor, or, or I mean Turkey and Asia Minor, and they never going to go back. He said, let's go find out how the churches are doing that we planted. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with him John called Mark. Now, this Mark is the one who wrote the Gospel of Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take him with them, or take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia, and who had not gone with them in the work. So what happened was Mark had gone, Mark's a younger man. So you get an older man of Barnabas, you have a, a, a little bit younger man of Paul, and a younger man in, in Mark. And Mark had gone with them, and God up in Pamphylia, he got up uh, you know, quite far north of Jerusalem, and for whatever reason, I don't know, he got sick, he got discouraged, whatever it was, he left them and went back. Now, Paul's the type of guy, he doesn't mess with fools, okay? I had you once, you turned back, I'm not taking you again, period. You get one shot with me, that's Paul. Is that Barnabas? Barnabas is always looking, what's God doing with you? I, I, need to, I need to give you some comfort. I need to give you some exhortation. What is God doing with you? God looked at Mark and said, Paul, you're wrong. God has a lot he wants to do with Mark. This is just what he did to the apostles with Paul. When Barnabas said, no, you're wrong. God has a lot that he wants to do with him. And he said, okay, you can have him. And now we have Paul. Now we have Mark, a nobody that Paul wants to throw away. You know, one of the reasons we have Paul is because of Barnabas. You know, one of the reasons we have the gospel of Mark? Well, let's continue on. Then the contention, verse 39, became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commanded by the brethren to the grace of God. And went through Syria and Sicilia, uh, strengthening the churches, or I'm sorry, Cilicia, uh, strengthening the churches. Now, they didn't stay parted, by the way. Next thing, the time they saw each other, they were good friends. This didn't mean they separated as brothers. What it meant was Barnabas said, must have said to Paul, okay, Paul, you're doing this on your own now. I've trained you all that I can. This man needs what I need to do with this man. And he took him and sent Paul on. Paul went on to do all the great things God wanted to do in him. Mark had, a, he had a, some training. He, Mark had to grow still. And we have the gospel of Mark to a great extent, once again, because of Barnabas. He saw what God was doing in others instead of always looking at others and seeing their faults. He could have said to Paul, I know. He chickened out on us last time. He doesn't have the courage to go on, which is how Paul would have thought. As an encourager, he said, we got to teach this kid some courage. <laughs> See the difference? That's why Paul, though, could do certain things. Paul could get stoned, beat up, left for dead, get up and keep going on, right? He had to have a certain makeup to do that. Barnabas, on the other hand, could see what God was doing. And here he stood up to Paul and said, no, you go on by yourself now. i got work to do with him. We know that Mark was someone that God used. This is what encouragers do. They see the potential in others because they see what God is doing. And they work with them. Sometimes when others will not. Also, encouragers are filled with a passion of, for God's purpose. Encouragers, and we're talking about the spiritual encouragement because we're looking at Barnabas. They're filled with a passion for God's purpose. What is it that God wants and I want to do it? And so they receive their encouragement from God. If you see God's purpose, you're going to be encouraged. Barnabas always was looking, what is it that God's purpose is? And then I will do that and God encouraged him through it because he was doing what God wanted to do. Look at Acts 11. Acts eleven nineteen. There was a lot of persecution in the church at this time. Verse 19 says, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. 
So, of course, as the Jews left Jerusalem, because Stephen was killed, as they're, as they're spread out, where do they go? Well, they go to the synagogue. They go to their Jewish friends. They go to their Jewish uh, families. And they continue to spread the word. The church continues to spread, but it stays almost exclusively a, a, a Jewish church. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching, to the, Lord, uh, preaching the Lord Jesus. And a hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So now they sent back to Jerusalem. Wow, we have all these other people responding to the gospel. What are we supposed to do? Verse 22, the news of these things came to the ears of the church at Jerusalem. Well, who are you going to send? And they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Who did John and James and Peter, who did they send? Well, we've got a new bunch of people. They're going to need a lot of encouragement. Hey, Barnabas, we got a job for you. And he always went. And he came, and he had seen the grace of God. And when he came, verse 23, he had seen the grace of God. He was glad. He sees what God is doing, so he's encouraged. That's what's so amazing about him. Where's he always getting his courage from? His encouragement, his comfort. He always sees what God is doing. He was glad and encouraged them all. He encouraged all these new people. He encouraged them all that, that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. That's an amazing statement. Isn't it? A bunch of new people. He encourages them with purpose of heart. Let me tell you God's purpose, because he saw God's purpose. Encouragers are motivated with passion. When we lose our passion, when we lose our passion for God in his way, we become discouraged. We lose our way. Barnabas always had a passion. And he, there he is, sent out again. Paul said Barnabas. Mark I'll take care of this. I'll take Mark. New people in the church, said Barnabas. And he encouraged them. And it's because in this passion, and this will be our, our, that, our fourth point, was that, that they are filled with a passion for God's purpose. Our fifth point is they're motivated by the submission to the parakletos. The, the, the helper. They're, they, they submit to it. They submit to God's spirit. They understand when God's doing something, so they submit to it. There's no, there's no warfare between them and God. They're not trying to push their will on God. They're always submitting to God's will. And because of that, they're always getting comfort and encouragement from God. Look at verse 24 here. Verse 24, still talking about Barnabas. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. A good man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. He could be a good man, but without God's Spirit, he couldn't do what he was doing. God worked in him because he submitted to God. Verse 25, Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. This was still always working with, with Saul, Paul. He went to find him. When he had found him, he brought him to, the, to Antioch. So he was, still in, he was still at this time period. It was before Mark. He was still working with Paul. He was still training Paul. He has all these new people. And he says, ah, this is a job for Paul. I need to go get Paul. I have them encouraged. I have them going in the right direction. Paul's got to teach them the depth of the doctrines. So he goes and gets Paul, and Paul comes and teaches them. And it says, so it was that for a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Antioch, Syria was a huge city. You now we think, oh, Antioch, Syria, that was not, probably not much of a city. Antioch, Syria was probably, well, it was either the third or fourth biggest city in the Roman Empire at the time. 
It was a major city. In fact, one of the things they really know about it is it was cramped. There were so many people crammed into the city. It was very cramped. He and Paul now spend a whole year there working. As he encourages, Paul teaches. This is, this is the, the character of Barnabas. I find just Barnabas so amazing to me. How, in the, how does this man, every place he goes, you know there's not one bad thing said about Barnabas in the entire New Testament. Every, everything is told about him. He's like fixing things. He's taking care of things. He's, he's moving people forward. He's encouraging them. He's getting Paul in the right way. He's getting Mark in the right way. And yet he was never one of the major leaders of the church. He just... Is someone who God used. And yet so much of the New Testament, a lot of it happened because of this man who was the son of encouragement. When you go through all this, there is a sixth thing that we see about encouragers. They are empathetic. They understand how other people are feeling. And still, to be empathetic and retain objectivity is very difficult. You know, if you're an empathetic person, uh, some people are very empathetic. And so they're with another person, and that person is crying. And pretty soon they're crying too. Or that person is angry, and they're angry too. I mean, sometimes empathetic people will become, you know, whatever the person next to them feeling, they feel. Uh, that's where empathy can be a bad thing. But if you have empathy and objectivity, you can feel what somebody else is feeling, but you can also help them. You can give them objective help. You can turn them to God. You can comfort them or exhort them, and you know what you're supposed to do. So empathy is a whole other subject, but it is at the core of an encourager. An encourager is an empathetic person. They... They, they're able to know what another person's state of mind is. And they're able to reach out and help them. What do you think about encouragement? It's contagious. But discouragement is contagious, isn't it? It's very contagious. Be around a discouraged person long enough. You know, I... I mean, if I'm around a discouraged person long enough and they don't seem to be making any progress, you know, after a while, I need to go off by myself for a while because I'm discouraged too. But encouragement is contagious, especially when it encourages us to turn to God and receive this help from God because it is God through his spirit that is our helper. So what happens... Uh, if you now say, okay, I want to be a, an encourager, what should I do? We'll just give a couple last points here. First of all, you have to pray for God to make you an encourager, to give you encouragement, to give you the purpose of heart that it says Barnabas had. You actually have to go pray for that kind of encouragement. You can't work it up. Oh, I'm going to go around and encourage everybody, everybody you know? So you just walk, do you need encouragement today? I mean, that's, you know, that's not how this works. Paul is sent a lot of times. You go here, you go there. there there's, need, there's a need for people to have courage here. Uh, let's get Barnabas. It's who he is. It's what he does. Ask God to give you that purpose of heart because your encouragement has to come through God's spirit. It's who he is. God's the great encourager, so we have to receive it from him. Remember we read at the very beginning, Paul said, we receive comfort so we can give the comfort to others. You have to receive this encouragement from God before you can just go around and giving it to everybody else. So ask for it. Then, when you find somebody who is discouraged, reach out to them. Reach out to them. Romans 15. Romans 15.
It's a very interesting passage here in Romans 15. Paul was talking about how we should deal with each other sometimes when we have disagreements over conscience. Uh, we, we, can have, we can have a doctoral agreement and disagreement over conscience. Exactly, um, exact issues of child rearing or exactly how to keep the Sabbath. And we can all have different conscience issues in that where some people do one thing and one person does another thing. So we're not disagreeing with doctor, but sometimes we're dis- disagreeing with the, how to apply directly certain things. And what he says here in verse 1, We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For Christ, even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached uh, you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that, through patience, that we through patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. Now, where does this comfort come from? We know it comes from God's Spirit, but it's this comfort of the Scripture. If you and I aren't in the Scripture, we're not going to receive the encouragement and comfort from God. Because it's there where God talks to us. So we have to pray for it, and then we search for it in the Scripture. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may be one-minded and one mouth, with one, uh, with one mind and one mouth, glorified the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how much comfort is in here. Encouragement. But we find it in the Scripture. When we receive this comfort from God, when we receive and go to the scripture and find it, then we are expected, as I said before, to pass it on. Sometimes I've, I've sat down with people who are suffering from, from discouragement or sometimes even depression. But, you know, discouragement and depression aren't the same thing. But, and I will tell them, okay, what are you going to do today for somebody else? And lots of times, well, I can't do anything for anybody else. I'm too discouraged, or I'm too depressed. Or I'm, no, what are you going to do today for somebody else? The act of giving changes who we are. It simply does. And sometimes when we're discouraged, we have to encourage someone else. Well, you, know, you walk up to someone and you say, hey, how's it going today? And they start telling you, oh, I'm just so discouraged. I went to work today and this happened and that happened. And they finish talking for a minute. And then what what do you and I do? We jump in telling all the bad things that happened to us today. And they walk away more discouraged than they were when they talked to us. We have to stop and share in somebody else's discouragement and give them encouragement. And when you do... I don't understand the spiritual law involved in this because it's not what the human mind says that should happen. When you encourage someone else who's discouraged, you become encouraged. It's, it's just a spiritual law. When you give, something happens that's positive. Anytime you give, something happens that's positive. So even when we're discouraged, and all of us are going to be from time to time, you can find a person that you can just give a little encouragement to as part of you getting out of your discouragement. And then, if you need an encourager, when you ask God to encourage you through his spirit, which he does, and God gives you his spirit, and it is your helper, it's your paracletos. But sometimes we need another person there too, and he understands that. And so, you, and you'll find all through the Bible where somebody needed an encourager and God sent one. Someone came along. Ask God for an encourager. Ask God, give me an encourager. And it may come in a way that you never thought. If you're a young person, it may be an older person that comes up and just talks to you and gives you a new viewpoint. If you're, an, uh, it's, if, if you're an older person, 
It may be a little kid. You ever, you ever feel down, a little kid comes up? Like my grandson always says, said, always reminds me, Grandpa, children are smarter than adults because they haven't forgotten how to play. Now say, hey, I think it's time to play. Ask God for an encourager. He might send someone to you that's going to give you exhortation. He might send someone to you who's going to say, hey, you can't stay where you are. So I'm going to push you a little bit. Not fun to be pushed, but God will send a pusher into your life. Now push you a little bit. And that's God helping you through the situation. One of the great needs in any group of people is for encouragers. Think about how much one person can help you in your life when you need encouragement. Think about maybe sometime when you needed a little push and someone came along and gave you that little push and it was God doing it. God is the great encourager. Christ said, I will not leave you orphans. I will send you, I will go to the Father, I'll pray to him and you will receive the Holy Spirit and I will come to you. That's what he says through the Holy Spirit. He says, I will come to you. I will encourage you. That's promise. And then we look at someone like Barnabas, and it's like, wow, look at the impact one encourager had. The impact of one converted man who was the encourager on the early church is amazing. And you'll find that little story by piecing together where Barnabas is mentioned in the Bible. Not too many places, but every place he is, it's pretty impactful. So let's finish with a scripture about God being an encourager. Isaiah chapter 40. Here God is encouraging ancient Israel. By reminding them who he is. We get discouraged because we see all the things that don't work around us. We see how the world doesn't work very well. Our lives don't always work very well. No matter how hard we try, things fail. And we get all caught up in this discouragement. What's my future going to be like? As we get caught up in all this discouragement, we forget God. It is God who works things out. The more you and I try to do it, the more mess we make. It is God who tells us how to do it. The more we try to do with our thoughts and our ways, the more we mess it up, the more failure we have. So here he encourages Israel when he says, verse 28 of Isaiah 40, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint to be weary and the young man shall utterly fall. But to those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength and shall mount up with wings like eagles and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. That's God saying, be encouraged. Be encouraged because he is never going to leave us, he's never going to forsake us, and he is going to give us the courage we need so that we're not discouraged, but we're encouraged so that we can continue to move forward and have him involved in our lives. And when Jesus Christ returns, he will give us the kingdom.